Hello and welcome back to the paddocks. Today we're covering Spa, the Belgian Grand Prix, and it's the last race before a month-long summer break. Sad face over here. On this episode, we have Meg, Amy, myself, Melissa, and Chelsea behind the scenes. So now let's get into what you all came here to catch up on, some pre-race fun. So going into the weekend earlier this week, Alpine actually unveiled their Deadpool and Wolverine special livery. And I gotta say, to be honest, it looks a little familiar to the Ferrari car, but nonetheless, it was a really cool looking car, especially with the like the little Wolverine scratches. And I just know Esteban's Marvel loving heart is just like enjoying the heck out of it. And even Pierre also had a special helmet that was more Wolverine inspired that he didn't, I, at least I didn't see him like post anything about it, but he did have something cool. But if I were Alpine and I had the chance to do something like this, I personally would have one car, Essie Bessie being like the whole Deadpool thing, delivery, the suit and the helmet. And then like Pierre being Wolverine because, you know, like besties, enemies, all that stuff. I thought, I think it'd be really cool, but also, you know, it's kind of expensive. I honestly was expecting that after hearing that one was going to be more Deadpool and one was going to be more Wolverine. I thought that's what was coming, but you know what? Still, as a Marvel girly, this makes my heart happy just seeing it like on track because the last time I feel like they did something like this was when Red Bull collabed with Star Wars back in Monaco, like many, many years ago. So just to see that kind of happen again was so cool. I will say what I loved was the fact that Esty got to do another Deadpool helmet because he's already done one. And so he got to kind of like refine his vision. Um, Pierre Gasly did do the Wolverine helmet. It was posted at least on his team page. Um, but I don't think I saw him make a post on his personal Instagram account. But I would have loved to see a very Deadpool livery and a very Wolverine livery, partly because I'm an X-Man girl. I love Wolverine. It would have been super sick. You could have done the slashes in the car. It would have looked super fire. But the weird thing for me with this was just, it was so weird having another red car on the grid it was the wrong shade of red so it was really easy to kind of tell okay that's not ferrari but it's still through my brain for a loop because we're so used to the traditional alpine colors and it was just such a far departure from their traditional brand but when ryan reynolds is involved in your team and he suggests an idea you do not tell him no um it also is just a genius marketing move because Everybody has been talking about the movie, so capitalize on that. Now they should definitely take advantage of Travis Kelsey and the other players from the 49ers and do something with that with the special livery for football season. My mind just like thought of that. Be really cool, wouldn't it be? Like, think about it, Alpine, if you guys are listening. Now, Yuki also had a cool helmet going into the weekend. Um, it looked like he collabed with either like a gaming platform or like a video game. I don't know much about anything outside of Nintendo. So apologies. Uh, something called Valorant, but it looked pretty cool. I thought it was like something anime because they had like a girl, like an anime looking girl and everything on the helmet. But nonetheless, super cool. I was just like, oh, kind of different looking at least. Mel absolutely just got the gears turning in my head when she mentioned a football-themed livery for Alpine. Can we please make this happen? Um, football helmets. It's it, We've already seen one done before. Do slightly different versions. We've already seen a football field on a helmet. Like, come on. Give me a full car. Go all out. Absolutely. Yes, please. In other F1 breaking news, dare I say... It has been confirmed that Esteban Ocon is going to Haas with Ollie Bierman, which I was not all that surprised when the news came out, but I'm definitely a little worried about how this is going to go. If I am going to put a bet on something, my money is on that it's all going to be fine until Ollie shows that he is a total threat. And I don't think that's going to take very long because I think Ollie is going to come out the gate swinging. But that's just me. I am an Ollie Bierman fan. So I'm also just kind of manifesting that for him. 
But we all know that Esty is a talented driver, but he has a history of not being the best teammate. Alpine's current situation is kind of proof of that, and if I'm being really honest. So we're going to see how this driver pairing goes. We've never seen Esteban with a rookie driver. So I'm very interested to see how that goes, if he's able to take on a kind of mentor kind of persona, or if that's just not his vibe. Which, if it's not his vibe, that's totally fine. In other Esteban Ocon related news. I found this graphic online that I just, I think it lays things out in a very interesting way. So in 2016, Nico Hulkenberg announced that he was leaving Force India. In 2017, Esteban Ocon joined Force India. In 2019, Nico left Renault. In 2020, Esty joined Renault. Now, in 2024, Nico is leaving Haas, and in 2025, Esty is joining Haas. I, history seems to be repeating itself. Does this mean that we're going to see Esty at Audi Sauber in, like, six years? Who freaking knows? We're going to find out, but I just think that little bit of um, repetition just made me giggle, and I really couldn't tell you why. I love when stuff like this happens because it just gives me a false sense of hope. And it's just fun to watch like little patterns like that because it's just like, hmm, like w- once, OK, twice. But once it happens like three times or more, it's just like, OK, this is a little too weird universe. What is going on? Um, but I also saw like when these changes happen, it also so happens that Lewis wins the World Driver Championship the following season. So eighth driver's championship for lewis with ferrari in 2025 maybe not but y'all know being the lulu is a salulu absolutely a thousand percent yes and some more breaking f1 news it was announced that bruno famine alpine's team boss is set to step down from his role after the belgian grand prix this race weekend i think that's a little crazy did I see it coming? Yes, somewhat. But I really didn't think that they were going to do it before summer break. I thought that they were going to give him until after the break, let him come back, see if coming back from the break refreshed may have changed things. But they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah, it's officially confirmed because it was later like posted by the team and like F1 of the change. But Honestly, to me, it's like, if it's not one thing, it's another with Alpine. I just feel like they just need a whole new, like, revamp at this point. Spa is the bearer of bad news for team bosses at Alpine because Spa last year was when Otmar was announced to be leaving the team. So it's just kind of like a big coinky dink that both team bosses were announced to be leaving at spa i don't know i thought it was just an interesting little tidbit i honestly don't think i even made that connection until you just said that um alpine i'm gonna need a rebrand y'all you know what what i really need rebrand come back as reno bring back cyril call it a damn day we know it works if it wasn't broke why like it wasn't broke why did you try to fix it just no (laughs) bring cyril back that's my personal stands. Heading into this race weekend, it was also announced that Max Verstappen was going to be taking a 10 place grid penalty for a new internal combustion engine, which we all kind of knew was going to happen because Red Bull used all of their new engine parts like way early in the season. So now pretty much every time he needs a new internal combustion engine, that man is taking a 10 place grid penalty, which just sucks but that's neither here nor there that's Red Bull's problem Audi also announced that Mattia Bonato will be back on the grid as their chief operation and chief technical officer starting August 1st to head up their efforts ahead of their 2026 debut does this mean that we're actually going to see Carlos to Audi because apparently Carlos and Mattia Bonanno have a really great relationship. I don't know, but I have so many thoughts as to like 
and questions on why would you even bring Mattia back at all? Because Ferrari was a hot mess express with that man. Yeah, I have to say, Bernardo, can you just leave the sport for like ever? I am just kidding, but not really. But I do get why teams would want him to join, especially like a new coming new team coming on in the next like few years. All that experience and like knowledge within the sport already, like why not? And I also see why Carlos would join in 2026 as well. As soon as I saw that announcement, I think the next post was literally a picture of Carlos and Bonotto together. So I was like, okay, I think this does make sense. Although James Vowles is not backing down. So we shall see over summer break. And we have another round of penalties and grid place drops. And that is for Yuki Sonoda because this poor man got hit with a 60-place grid penalty. Yes, you heard that correctly, y'all. 60 places. He took a new internal combustion engine, turbocharger, motor generator unit for heat, motor generator unit for kinetic, and energy store, and control electronics. Like, oh my god, I know all of those things come with a 10-place drop, but like, wow, you, you couldn't have stopped at like 20? What was he supposed to do? I think they low-key were expecting them to start from Japan because 60 is just outrageous. I just want to know how they came up with that number. Questions. The interview where Will Buxton told him that he had a 60-place grid drop is the best thing I think I've ever seen on the internet because Yuki's face just says everything because, like Mel said, was he supposed to start from Japan? Was he supposed to start from, like, the race three weeks ago like how do you take a 60 place grid penalty i mean i know jensen button still technically has a grid drop from like a previous season that he never took because he left the sport but like how is someone supposed to take a 60 place grid drop i just i have so many questions with penalties like that for real because again there's only 20 spots like does that roll over what happens I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. However, for free practice, not much happened, but we're just going to review it real quick. FP1 to start off the weekend. The first session we had Max in P1, followed by Oscar and surprise, surprise, Alex Albon. Not going to lie. That was actually pretty fun to see him up there. In the following session, we had Lando in P1, followed by Oscar and then Max. A nice little mix from the last session with a new driver involved. Now, for the final practice session, we got Max in P1 again, and then Oscar making another appearance in P2, and Pierre closing out P3. Again, love the variety that we see in practice sessions, because it's always like, what if this wasn't a practice session, it was a race, like how it could end. Now, when we got into Quali and Q1, it was typical spa fashion, because it was damp. It's always, I feel like, there's always rain. Every single time we're at spa, whether that's free practice, quali, the race, it's just, I feel like it's never dry the whole weekend. It never is. And whenever you get a wet quali session, just get your popcorn ready because anything can happen these next like 45 to an hour. And then they hadn't even gotten the green light at the end of the pit lane And the McLaren boys were having issues between Lando and the white line at the end of the pit lane and Oscar and one of the Haas boys. I don't know what was going on. It was a little chaotic. Personally, for me in Quali, I think myself and a lot of Red Bull fans for sure, but just like Formula One fans in general, had their eyes on Checo because Max was going to be getting a 10 place grid drop. So in my opinion, Checo really needed to show up this weekend. So I was like watching that man like a hawk all Q1. (laughs) It was a little crazy. Yeah, I agree. He had to like take advantage of the whole penalty with Max and just show the team what he has and like what he's worth and convince a way for everyone. Helmet Marco, I'm looking at you. Stop making comments. Uh but we'll just have to see how it turns out for him, really. 
The incoming rain messages that kept coming over the radio. Oh, my Lord. Yes, it's super on brand for spa, but it will always stress me the heck out. I don't know why, but anytime I hear those radio messages, I just get a little anxious. And I know I'm not the only one. I mean, would it truly be a week in that spa without some moisture? Think about it. Huh? But I swear Pierre always shows out at this, like particular circuit i just feel like he's truly like honoring his friend antoine which i love what he does like leading into the weekend with the whole like um running event that he does and everything but like i don't know it's just like a little spark in him always comes out in belgium now i know all of pgp definitely heard me scream but i'm pretty sure half of f1 heard me scream because daniel ricardo put it in p2 at some point in q1 and i was not okay I don't care if it was just for like a hot second. I was unwell. (laughs) It made me so, so happy, especially because it put him ahead of Checo. And I just kind of like loved the subtle poetic justice of that for some reason. I just did not ever expect to see a V-carb head of a Red Bull ever. And I don't think anyone ever did. And some things that people probably weren't expecting is Fernando hauling the heck out of that tractor of the Aston Martin because he was putting in work. And not going to lie, Stroll was too. They were just like putting up that car like up in the upper midfield when it's been not so great these past weekends, I feel like. But it's always nice to see Fernando just putting in work because I don't expect less from the man. Towards the tail end of Q1, it kind of felt like it was time to just like cue the bleeps over the radio while we were waiting for Q2 to hit. If you missed the announcement that hit, the FIA told the drivers to stop swearing as over the radio, which just makes me laugh because these guys are driving cars at crazy fast speeds and you want them to watch their language. You're lucky that like they're able to speak in English half the time. I, I mean, what do you expect from these drivers? They're they, they, no, they cannot filter themselves while they are like driving at high speeds on racetracks and trying to keep themselves and everybody else around them safe and win a race at the same time. Exactly, because I don't know why the FIA came up with that rule. We know the FIA is just going to FIA because at the end of the day, if people are that upset over curse words and what the drivers say watch the kids broadcast it's fun but no curse words the kids broadcast is awesome but also it's like they bleep them out you don't actually know what they're saying like most of us can infer but like if you're around motorsport you probably swear at least a little bit i feel like maybe that's me as a car girl but like i don't know I felt like we were going to get a version of Lewis when he was told he couldn't wear jewelry and he showed up to the paddock absolutely dripping in jewelry. Chains on chains, like multiple nose rings, like it was just insane. And I just kind of was expecting the bleeps to be off the charts this race weekend after that announcement hit. I mean, have you heard Gunther Steiner? Like, that should tell you all when it comes to curse words in F1. But Lando nearly gave me a freaking heart attack during Q1 because McLaren, they didn't know when the rain was coming and decided to send him out early and then that screwed everything over. And there were a couple drivers that were in the bottom as well during Q1 where I was like, oh my god, is this really happening right now? Like... Way to get our hearts pumping at, like, 10 a.m. By the end of Q1, we lost Nico, Kevin, Yuki, Logan, and Joe. Kind of your usual bottom five-ish. Like, maybe a little variation, but, like, your usual suspects. Now, going into Q2, it was funny hearing the radio messages because Danny Rick was being told that there's no rain, while Lando is being told that Class 1 rain will be starting soon, which apparently Class 1 is just really a light drizzle. I just thought it was funny that they labeled it as such because, like, Class 1, class I don't know. It was just interesting. 
But speaking of McLaren, I absolutely love when they have the Tomorrowland logo. This year they had it uh, towards like the front end, like the front side of the uh, car. And it was just like love with the little like Tomorrowland like butterfly. And then like on their halo, they had Tomorrowland. It just makes my little raver heart happy um, to see that coming up this week well this week and then last weekend was the festival so i'm like oh that's pretty cool um but i wonder if we'll see lando and max head out there again this year um like they did last year i mean they are both besties with martin garrix so part of me wouldn't be that surprised plus i'm pretty sure both of those boys have money for private jets i mean max has his own um I think I even saw Max on a helicopter like this race weekend. So like I know they can get there. It's just whether or not they actually want to, but they definitely can. Now over the radios we or over the commentators, we started hearing them talk about that Mercedes were using old specs on their car instead of the upgrades. And honestly, it really didn't sound that promising because the last few minutes of this quality session were getting real close and by the end, we saw Alex Albon leave, followed by Gasly, then Danny Rick, Botas, and Stroll. Again, like Amy had mentioned earlier, nothing new, nothing surprising. It's kind of like the usual crowd. Um, and then going into Q3, we at least saw Checo finally keeping up with Max this time around. I was happy to see him make it into Q3, finally. The minute I saw Checo make it to Q3, I was like, do not jinx it. Do not jinx it. Do not jinx it. Because I really was worried about how this was going to go for him this race weekend. Because I, he has not been doing well in quali. So I was honestly expecting, like, the bar was on the floor, y'all. Like, absolutely, the bar was on the floor. Now, Charles, Mark Hervé, Percival Leclerc had my heart in my throat. Per usual, I, oh, it was so perfect. It was so perfect. I can't. I, I have nothing else to add to this, y'all. <laughs> Literally, the gasp I gasp when he finished that lovely laugh, like, it was just a work of art, truly. He was definitely one I was not expecting on pole this weekend, but the rain makes for absolute chaos, and I'm here for it because it shakes everything up for the race. Now, of course, Max made sure to get pole with the 10 place grid penalty going on. And I'm not surprised, but I would also do the same as him. Like, let me be petty and get pole anyways. And I'll just start from P10 like you guys made me. Um, but it's also lovely to see Checo up there again in the front row. Like, it was just a long time coming. And I bet that probably, like, helped his, like, mental a lot. As bad as this may sound, especially as someone who is the Red Bull girl of the group, I really question if Checo was going to be able to hold on to his qualifying spot once the race starts. I know that's probably going to piss off some Checo fans, but like I genuinely after quality was super worried about is he actually going to be able to hold on to that because his past performance has just shown us that at least recently that's not possible whether that's a checko issue or a car issue a both problem i don't know yeah because if i'm being honest i'm not that much of a check i like i like checko but i'm not i wouldn't say i'm a checko fan but being honest i didn't really have high hopes of him holding on to that spot but i always hope that he just proves us wrong because i would want any driver to prove me wrong with what i think might happen our top 10 was as follows Charles, P1, Checo, P2, Lewis, P3, Lando in P4, Oscar in P5, George, P6, Carlos, P7, Fernando, P8, Esteban, P9, Max technically was in P11 because of penalties, which had Alex Albon promoted to 10th because of said penalties. And post-qualifying, Zhou Guan Yu was given a three-place grid penalty for the next race due to impeding Max in the qualifying session. Now, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes, which is the race. 
And personally for me, when F1 TV makes a point of saying that Max has never won from this far back on the grid, I, A, had my eyebrow raised and go, oh, wow, I don't actually think I, like, that never clicked in my head when I saw his qualifying position. But, like, guys, don't give him a reason to pop off. It's, why are you challenging him like that? I don't know. I just, that feels like you're asking for trouble. And my thing is, we saw Max winning from somewhere that's not like the top three and win the race how many times last year? Like, I remember last year was just at the point where it's like, he can start from like P19 and still win. And like, something would happen where we have like a big penalty and still win the race. Like, why even say something like that when clearly, again, like Amy said, he will pop off and prove us all wrong. I mean, Lap two, Max was already up to P8. The man was on a mission. It was ridiculous. I was at the edge of my seat, but like the minute the race started, normally I'm very chill for the start and I get progressively more anxious. No, no, no. Not this weekend for Spa. I was just like anxious the whole way through. Yeah, especially since he was behind Lando. And at this point, I was just like, I wonder if Lando will put up more of a fight for the grid position this time around compared to like I think it was like two races ago where kind of just like let Max go by and like didn't really put up a fight not Lando giving me another heart attack again when he went into the gravel literally first corner turn one of the race that cost him some time in some places and then put him closer into Max's reach the inside positions seem to have gained dramatically at the start so like the odd number positions which is interesting how like at every track it seems like quality position is different on who benefits more or less depending on what the run down the turn one looks like so I know like pole is like what you want but it's almost like maybe you should strategically plan to get like I don't know p3 or something for qualifying so you can get a better start I don't know people should start to think about that during summer break I do know on certain tracks that is something that strategists think about where like there are certain tracks where like they actually want you to start P2 because you have a better line or you have cleaner line or whatever. Um, I, I love the strategy side of F1. I think it's so cool. Lap three, Lewis immediately puts it in the lead as soon as he has a DRS available. Damn, sir. I... I forgot who you were for a hot second. You immediately reminded me the minute you took that one. Sauber was having issues with Joe's car so early in this race. It hurt my soul. Guys, can we please get it together? Like losing power on lap four of a 44 lap race is a big, big, big red flag if you ask me. I ugh, it was just a hot mess. I swear, Joe has the worst luck and it truly hurts because I feel like if he has the car, he can definitely be showing out. Um, and it just sucks because it's like at this point, I'm like, Sauber, I just need you guys to do like a whole revamp as well um, because you guys have two pretty solid drivers and this just keeps on happening. Like what is going on? I think the thing that bothers me the most with Sauber and Zhou is the fact that, like, he's our first Chinese driver, and I feel like he's not been given a fair chance to prove his abilities. But that's just me. Lewis Hamilton gave me some major, major Sebastian Vettel flashbacks. And if you know, you know when I say these words. There's something moving between my legs. Um, though Sebastian's was, there's something loose between my legs. Um, it just had me giggling because it, 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 when you've been an F1 fan for long enough, the word association just goes like a pit stop fast. Sauber had me shouting at my TV per usual at this point. They just kind of always make me yell at my TV because Joe got a few laps after a, basically a control alt delete and they were able to kind of fix the issues with the car and then all of a sudden the issues were just back tenfold. 
this kid has no luck and I need to know whoever cursed him because I want to have some words, please. Honestly, same, because at this point in the race when Joe had DNF'd, it's just like they just can't get it together, it seems. And it's just been painful to watch, honestly. Something drastic needs to happen over like the first week of summer break or something because I know technically they're not able to work during that time or Audi just needs to step in now and be like listen we need you to do better before we take over but I just feel so bad for Joe and Valtteri because they just keep getting I don't know screwed over every weekend and it just it's not fair to both of them. Now it seems like Some of the other teams are learning from Ferrari and labeling their strategic plans as plan A, B, C, all the alphabet. But honestly, I get flashbacks to Ferrari themselves and their million plans that seem to never work, honestly. It really was giving flashbacks to Ferrari coming across the radio and saying plan Z. No, please no. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. We do not have time for this, guys. Now, this is really random, but... At some point in the race, I just thought to myself that was so glad that they took away that weird camera point of view of them panning over the track in a movie type of way. I mentioned it last week, but I was so happy because that camera angle, that camera panning was just really annoying. It was the drone footage. They had drone coverage last race weekend, and it also drove me up a wall. I like the helmet cam. I like the like front wing cam. I love that angle. I think that's super cool. But, like, the drone footage made me dizzy at one point. I agree, and I feel like they were doing that for the F1 movie coming out next year, like, just getting footage for it because, side note, we still see Brad Pitt around the paddocks doing his thing. Do your job, honey, but I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of, like, overseeing him, too. But that's just me. Now, I was finally happy to hear Charles giving suggestions to the strategy, but alas, Ferrari didn't take his suggestion and still pit him because he was just like, no, keep me out. Like, I think he was probably like a one-stop stint. But sometimes, again, I wish they would listen to their driver's, like, input a little bit more in general. Not only Ferrari, but, like, every single other team, too, because at the end of the day, they're the ones driving. They know. They feel the car. Like, they know, in my personal opinion, a little bit more than they do. I know they're all professionals and everything, but, like, again, they're the ones driving the car. Oscar Jack Piastri, my guy. You were absolutely on one this race. I was absolutely shocked. I am slowly becoming more and more and more of an Oscar Piastri fan. And I am no longer complaining about it. I love this journey for me. I am here for the roller coaster at this point. Now, that replay in the pit lane of Oscar and Lewis, like one of them, it was... Oscar pitting, like, pulling into, like, his area of the pit lane and, like, Lewis pulling out, like, they literally did, like, a little crisscross, and I was worried for a hot second, but then afterwards, it was just really satisfying to see them, how it was just, like, perfectly, like, in sync, like, they just, like, did, okay, pardon me, just gonna, whoop, and switch, and scary, but fun. Now, if these are words I think most Formula One fans probably hated hearing come across a Red Bull radio, and those are the words. I think we should go get them from Max Verstappen. Because, like, oh, okay, Maxi, now I'm a little nervous. Like, I I, I know he's going to – I knew he was going to be on an absolute mission this race weekend. But, like, I I know that radio message probably had some Formula One fans quaking in their damn boots. Sorry, guys, but you know I'm right. Not going to lie, you are right. But I was also just, like, wondering, more, like, worried about how the guy in front of him, George, will react to Max. Because, you know, George sometimes doesn't care and will risk it all for a grid position. Like, we've seen it a few times, and we know the history between the two of them as well. So, take that as you will. I'm not going to lie. Whenever either of them separately are involved in something, I get very scared. And I get hold and I get worried and I just hold my breath and hope whoever's involved comes out on the other side, okay. And when it's both of them involved, like Mel said, they have history, 
So it scares me a little bit. But I think they've been behaving as of recently. So all's good. All's good in the world of Max and George racing each other. Checko. Checko, my guy. What the hell? It's like you didn't even try to fight George. Like, not even a little bit. I know he probably had, like, no chance. But damn, that overtake really, really hurt. I, oh, it was so painful. It really was because Checo was just like, ah, yes, George. Here you go. And, like, just kept on, like, letting George go into, like, the sunset, essentially. But... We're halfway through the race, and we got Lewis leading again. We had a few different race leaders, honestly, halfway up to the race, and with Charles and Oscar behind him. Now, anybody who has listened to PGP for a little bit knows that myself and Rachel are like the Logan Sergeant stands of the bunch. We go hard for our boy. I was losing my mind, shouting at my television, watching that kid defend because goddamn did he defend. I don't care that it was defending P17. He was defending. Go off, baby. It warmed my heart so, so much. And then Ferrari just stomps on my heart because lap 26, they pit stop and it's 3.4 seconds. There goes your undercut, guys. What the heck was that? They try their best, I guess. That's all. Daniel Ricardo for me was like really on one this weekend. Maybe that was just like me personally, but it was so nice for me to see racy Daniel Ricardo back. Just just even like a little bit mildly baby racy. It was just so nice for me. And that's partly just because I'm a Danny stan, but... I feel like he's getting his confidence back. Like these last few race weekends, I just feel like we've seen a little bit more of like the Danny that got me into Formula One. Not to that same level, but like the personality is coming back. The the drive is there. I just I feel like he's back to himself a little bit more than he was. I'm I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely here for the like ongoing battling between him and Alex over the past couple of weekends like I'm here for it because I love both of them as drivers and just seeing them get to kind of hash it out between themselves and it's actually really good battling if you watch the two of them because they're both fair they give each other space and it's really interesting to watch and it I don't know it just makes the race more entertaining to watch the two of them I've always loved watching the midfield battles because they just give us all the action, especially when it's like kind of a, a dual, a dull race, um, so to speak. But I got a little giggle when Mercedes were pitting Lewis for their second pit stop. And I guess they like let George know about it or whatever. And George was just like going on the radio talking about going for a one stop stint. I just found it interesting. Um, you know, sometimes... Again, they know the car better and everything, but the tire whisper does come out sometimes. One of my favorite things is when F1 drivers put on their strategist hat and just, I don't know, a Formula One driver wearing their strategist hat is just very special. It's very interesting to watch. Lap 27, Max is running in third after starting the race in 11th, and I was not okay. Sir... What the heck? I know I always talk about pixie dust, but oh my god. I know the Red Bull is a rocket, but that just felt like more than just being a rocket. I know a lot of that is Max's ability to drive the car to the max and get the most out of it, but that was definitely a little crazy to see. Gotta give him credit when it's due because that guy is really in a league of his own. This race was so good for me because getting to see Oscar Piastri as a race leader again just brings me so much joy. I know I said that I'm becoming more of an Oscar fan, but oh my God, I loved seeing him lead. I I don't know. There's just something about it that just brings me joy. And as Crofty said, B12 
beware the quiet man. It's really facts because Oscar quite literally keeps his head low, like races and then like disappears for like the week and just like <laughs> does his own thing. So watch out for him. I've always thought that, especially like this, this season as he's just grown as a driver. But again, we just had such a variation of like race leaders this weekend. I've just been loving it because it's just full of that, that what if this happens, what if that happens? Like it's so much fun. Oscar's like the younger version of Kimi Raikkonen and I'm here for it. He's like the new Iceman, but he's more like cat, if that makes sense. I don't know how else to describe it, but I'm here for it. And I love that Spa always creates chaos. Now, sometimes it's not the best chaos, but thankfully today was good chaos. I mean, not the best chaos in the sense that it has created some, like, pretty nasty crashes in the past, like yellow flags, red flags, and such like that. And thankfully, today we did not see any of that. And I am here, like Mal said, for a variation of race leaders because... It keeps you on the edge of your seat, and you don't know who's going to win, and that's the best type of racing. Meg, the fact that you said that Oscar is Kimmy makes it even better because of the fact that he retweeted, someone made a little cartoon of him and Kimmy, and he he's fully embracing the fact that he is Kimmy Raikkonen 2.0, and I love it because I will always be an Iceman fan. But the Formula One gods really just said that we needed a little bit of spice this weekend. Just just a smidge, just a little something, something. But, like, they gave it to us all right. Someone was tumbling down the stairs to her death. But, yeah, no, they definitely gave us a little spice because, literally, McLaren had a very t- terrible pit stop for Oscar. Like, it was painful to watch. Sometimes McLaren just, like, bins it. But also, like, Oscar definitely, at least it looks like, he came in a little too hot into the pit box because, okay. I just know that Whiplash was nasty because that poor mechanic, like, literally was just yeeted into oblivion. And I feel for that front jack guy because it's not the first time Oscar has done that. So I feel so bad for that man because he just absorbed all of that energy to get Oscar to stop but he must be swole if he can stop an F1 car so go front jack guy Oscar Piastri get that man a beer at least lap 33 I was definitely starting to get real stressy because y'all speaking of McLaren binning it I don't know why they pitted Lando again considering they kept him out longer in the first stint And then pitted him. And then they saw that the one stop was okay with George. So I don't know why they pitted him again. Because he could have been P1 at that moment if they didn't stop him again. I don't know. McLaren is starting to turn into the new Ferrari. Welcome to the club. We welcome you very warmly. Now, but you always know a lot can happen in the last like 10 to 11 laps. And honestly, like it's just, I've been loving it to see the different things that could possibly happen. Lap 36, what seems to be my new normal, Oscar Piastri has me shouting at my television because come on, man. No, he truly was on a mission and I love that little battle between him and Charles because I, again, just love me a good battle and a fight for positions, especially when it's like a podium finish. But up ahead, that gap between the Mercedes was just closing in little by little and truly on the edge of my seat. The gap was down to 2.4 seconds between the Mercedes boys and with Oscar it was 3.5 seconds behind which just was crazy. Of course I was shouting at my TV yet again because Daniel Ricciardo was in the points and I literally was like covered in goosebumps thought I was gonna cry. I was so not okay (laughs) i wish i could have had a camera going in my living room for people to see my reactions real time because i was a hot mess now what is wild to me is that checo started from p2 and at this point in the race he wasn't p8 like 
I need you to ponete la pilas because Checo, you're not helping yourself out at this point. Especially with Danny running in 10th. Like, bro, this is not a good look. I had kind of said at the end of Quali that I wasn't sure if Checo was going to hold on to his P2 and like I hated to be right. But now I'm really, really starting to worry for his contract at this point because what is happening? I know people always talk about the yips, but this is like more than the yips at this point. I'm starting to wonder at this point if we'll even see Checo and Red Bull after summer break. I know they're having a meeting this week coming up about it but we'll see and then whoever came over the mercedes radio to say just make sure you give each other enough give each other plenty of space had me losing it because oh god you guys don't say that because that's just asking them to cause chaos literally my heart was beating so fast because again we know how george can be especially if he knows that he can win it he has high expectations of himself. Does it happen? Not really. But again, the man's willing to risk, risk it on. I was hoping for something else to happen. But again, edge of my seat. Another moment where I wish y'all had a camera view into my living room because I had my jaw on the floor for the last five laps. Holy strat call from Princess Georgie himself. He's never ever ever going to let people forget that he made that call wow 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 he really went from p6 to winning and god give him credit because he he knew what he was doing today listen me and amy i know are not the biggest georgie fans but he did deserve that win today he made the right call and his team listened to him and they backed him And they capitalized on it. So major props to him because he was able to keep the lead on a one stop. So good job, George. And that's a lot coming from me. It pains me, but you got to give credit where credit's due because he deserves it. We also need to give credit to Mercedes for the fact that like they listened to what he said and trusted his knowledge because this man pitted on lap 10. Lap 10, y'all. He made that call by himself. I still am like trying to process how somebody makes a call like that on lap 10. And of course, it was a Mercedes 1-2 because we had Lewis in P2 and Oscar in P3. Love when those two are on the podium together. They're, I don't know. It just warms my heart. We had Max go from P11 to P5, which was just madness. Checo somehow pulled out the fastest lap. Driver of the day was Lewis Hamilton, which makes so much sense in my head. And then we had a Gunther starting to end it all up. I don't know why it always makes me smile when I see him do interviews, but it just does. What killed me was Gunther asking Lewis if Lewis thinks he can challenge for the championship. And Lewis just straight was like, uh, no. It had me dry, like literally dying. But as for the driver's championship, of course, we still have Max leading. Like he just keeps on like going into the sunset. But we got Oscar who jumped from jump to P4 ahead of Carlos. And I think he could creep up and take P3 from Charles next. We'll have to see. But I'm actually happy for this turnaround for Mercedes. They've been putting in work to say the least, in their factory for sure. And happy for Oscar as always. Um, I just like seeing him on the podium and just putting in that work. He's just that quiet kid you got to watch out for. My favorite moment definitely had to be George and Lewis oh so effortlessly lifting up their head strategist because that just was like heartwarming. This was a fun race, but also at the same time, kind of a little boring since there was really only one spot for overtaking But you did truly never know who was going to win the race, which was awesome. It definitely gave me indie vibes, and I'm here for it. And I like that it's really anyone's game after summer break, and I think people are going to come back fighting. Now, PGP besties, listeners everywhere, we had some news a few hours after the race. George, our race winner 
has been disqualified from the race. Essentially, his car was one kilogram, if I am correct, with KG, whatever the abbreviations at. Yeah, everyone's nodding yes. So, yes, one and a half kilogram under the weight limit. Meaning the new P1 race winner is Lewis, Oscar in P2, and Charles in P3. I am sad we didn't get to finish to witness that podium. That's all I'm going to say. I honestly hate when these decisions come after the race instead of during or like immediately after in Park Ferme when they jump out of the car. It's just really not fair to drivers, especially in an instance like this one where George should have won that race, but the team unfortunately let him down. I will say we saw some really interesting theories on like why his car was underweight. Was it that there wasn't enough fuel? Was it that because he did a one stop that the tires were too worn and that's what made you lose that like kilogram and a half? I don't really know. While I definitely wish they could make the call immediately, I do think that it takes a bit for them to confirm that a car is underweight. I'm really not sure how the FIA tells teams that the weight of the car like what it is until later because I think they wait until they've weighed all 20 cars I'm not really sure what that process looks like but I definitely still think it could be done a little bit faster like or maybe it's that you have a a lag time before your podium so that you can have your actual podium be on your podium you know but with this reshuffling it also meant that Daniel Joseph Ricardo was in the points, baby. Obviously not the way he would have wanted to, but a point is a point and I will take it, y'all. Now, it's time for us to get into my favorite part of literally any race recap, and that is predictions. We are doing predictions for the Dutch Grand Prix after summer break. In true witchy fashion, I, of course, pulled out my pendulum because what else am I going to do? P1, Max Verstappen. We all know he's going to be a man on a mission, especially coming back from summer break. I also think Red Bull is going to be coming back out for blood. So we're going to see how Zambort goes. P2, Lando. McLaren has shown me that they have the car and they have the pace to do well. So... I'm hoping it works. I also think that Lando is going to feel like he has something to prove post-summer break. So it just feels very plausible. P3, Oscar Piastri. I feel like this kid has just been so consistent and definitely wants to prove himself. Again, McLaren has a car. So it should be really doable for them to get both of their drivers on a podium. I do also predict a lot of driver market chaos when they get back from the break, but I also can kind of see some news coming out over the break as well because people have the time. I agree, Bestie, because some interesting stuff will definitely be happening with the driver market in these coming weeks. I mean, we still have four seats open, and at this point, it's really anyone's game. Are we going to get some new rookies? What switcheroos are we going to see? I am excited because I love drama. But as for the Dutch GP, it's Max's home race. In my opinion, he has to win this one. Um, I've lost count on how many races it's been since he hasn't won. It's already two po- two races in a row where he's not on the podium in general. So I just know he's just itching for a win at this point. Like He's not going to take P2 or P3. Like It has to be first place now for p2 i'm gonna go with oscar um he just keeps on showing what he's got and isn't playing around if you ask me and as for p3 i'm gonna say lewis because i mean who doesn't love him on the podium i honestly don't even know what to say anymore because i'm always wrong all i'm close but no cigar i'm hoping mclaren can get it together with their strategy and lando can get another win i know i say that every time and I've said that for the past I don't know how many recordings I think Hungary honestly messed with him mentally so hopefully over the break he can recover get some time enjoy it and then come back fighting and even stronger 
for P2 and P3, I honestly couldn't tell you just because it's so close now. It'll, I know it'll be between Max, Oscar, and one of the Mercedes boys. I don't know in what order, but excited to see. And to close out our episode, we have a moment of the weekend. And that is the fact that this is the first Grand Prix where both pole and the win have been inherited. Charles Leclerc inherited his pole position. Lewis Hamilton inherited his win. And I just think that's absolutely bonkers. What a race weekend. From previous penalties to a disqualification of the original race winner, Spa has been chaotic per usual. We want to know what your favorite race moment was this weekend. Make sure to let us know on our socials. Everywhere we are Paddock Girls Podcast, except for Twitter, where we are Paddock Girls Pod. Join us next weekend as we enter into summer break. And thank you so much for joining us in the paddock. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. See you soon.